church online today as we gather together to worship our Lord. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about our thinking and our mind. And a little later today, we're going to be hearing some words that Paul wrote that have to do with our thinking and our mind. I'd like to encourage you uh, to prepare uh, to look at the Word of God together. So I would encourage you right now, if you don't have it near you, to grab your Bible or to grab your iPad, or whatever it is that you uh, look at the Word of God on and read the Word of God on, and find the book of Philippians chapter 3. And in just a little bit, we'll be looking at some things that Paul wrote there. But in just a moment, we're going to gather together to worship in song. But before we do that, I'd like to ask you to join me, and let's pray together and ask God to bless this time. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together as the people of God. And I know today we're not gathering in a building, uh, but we are in our homes, but we are gathered together through video. We are gathered together for the same Lord, the Lord Jesus, and we are your people. And we ask today that you would visit us. We ask that you would speak to us, you would challenge us, and you would work in the transformation of us to more and more resemble your son Jesus and your values and ways as we live in this world. Father, in these next moments, we just ask that your spirit would touch us. We pray that our worship will be pleasing to you. We pray that when we finish today, you will have spoken to us. You will have challenged us. You will have encouraged us. You will have given us what we need for this day. Father, we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I'm going to ask you to join with me, and we are going to worship together in song. Seal it for thy courts 
So we pull 
that's truly great and awesome. Give Him glory this morning. Worship Him with your whole body, all of our beings. It's His breath that's in our lungs. Thank our singers, our instrumentalists for leading us today as we've been worshiping in song. And they will be back in just a little bit to close us out as we finish up our service. But I want to ask us now to, to take the word of God. And again, uh, we are going to be looking at a passage uh, found in the New Testament book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 3. So I want to encourage you, if you have not turned there, 
uh, to take your Bible and do that with me today. Back in 1952, there was a woman by the name of Florence Chadwick, and Florence decided that she was going to attempt something that no woman had attempted up until that time, and that was to make the swim from California to Catalina Island. It's about a 26-mile swim. Think of it as a uh, marathon, but it's done in the water. On the day that she made her attempt, things started out really well. Uh, the water was smooth. Uh, the day was clear. Uh, right from the beginning, she could see the outline of Catalina Island uh, in her swim. But about 15 hours into that swim, uh, things began to change. A thick fog began to uh, set in over the water, and uh, it began to obscure her view of Catalina Island. In fact, the fog became so thick that eventually she could barely see a foot or two in front of her. In fact, she could hardly make out the boats uh, that were following her that carried people who were to help her if she ended up having some kind of an emergency. Well, she went on and swam about another hour in those kinds of conditions before she decided that she was going to call it quits. And so they hauled her up out of the water into the boat, uh, dejected and disappointed. But that dejection and disappointment was only going to deepen when a few minutes after getting into the boat, as the fog cleared, she was able to make out once again Catalina Island. And what she saw was that at that moment she realized that she had been less than a mile away from finishing her journey and walking up on Catalina Island victorious. Now, not one to be beaten, uh, two months later, uh, Florence decided that she was going to make another attempt at this swim. And so when that day came, it was almost exactly like her previous attempt. Uh, the day was absolutely beautiful. The water was calm. Things started off incredibly well. And then hours into the swim, once again, fog rolled in. In fact, it settled in so thick that once again, she, could, uh, she couldn't see the island at all and could barely see a foot or two in front of her. But this time, Florence didn't quit. Florence kept pushing forward stroke after stroke after stroke until at last she emerged from the waters and walked up on Catalina Island victorious. Now, what made the difference between her first and second attempts? Between the first that was a failure and the second that ended in victory. Because the conditions were virtually the same for both swims. When asked about it, she pointed out that it really boiled down to one thing. And that was vision or focus. On the first attempt, she lost her vision. She lost focus of the island in the fog. On the second attempt, she encountered the same fog, but mentally she kept in her mind a picture of the island. Mentally she kept in her mind a picture of what she was headed for, of, of where she was going to finish, and she said that ended up aiding her in continuing her swim and eventually claiming victory. You know, today as we enter our fourth week of our series titled Citizens, where we're looking at how do we live well as citizens of heaven here on earth. Today we're going to see that it's this issue of focus or this issue of vision that is so important in this matter. In fact, here in Philippians 3, where Paul is going to talk about this issue of focus or vision, this is also the very passage where we find the verse that is really the central verse for our entire uh, series in fact, if you've got your Bible open to Philippians chapter 3 and look down at verse 20, you'll see kind of our, our key verse. Paul says there, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul reminds us, and we need this reminder as we're moving through this series, that it is our citizenship in heaven 
that we have that is meant to shape and affect how we live our lives out here on earth. And part of the way that we're going to be able to live out that citizenship well, Paul's going to point out today, has to do with this matter of focus or vision. In fact, the verses that Paul is going to speak from that about are up just a little further up in chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. I want you to look, with the, look at those with me today. Paul says this, Not that I've already obtained all of this, or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, I forget what is behind, and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now, in our section of Scripture today, the Apostle Paul uses what is probably one of his favorite descriptions of the Christian life, and that is the description of looking at it through the lens of a race. Notice he speaks in these verses of heading toward a goal. He talks about that in verse 12. It's, it's like a runner breaking the tape. Or in verse 14, he says that I'm pressing toward the goal to win the prize. It's racing language, and it probably uh, was language and, and an idea that Paul drew right out of his own day and his own time. Uh, this letter of Philippians, Paul writes it to people that live at a place called Philippi, and in, in that city and in that surrounding area, uh, they were known for their sporting events, particularly this thing of racing. In fact, athletes would come from all over the area when they would hold games to participate. Now, the goal was, when you entered the games, was uh, to win at your event. And if you won at your event, you had the opportunity then to walk up a set of stairs that led to this upraised platform on which sat a judge, and that judge then awarded to you your prize for completing your event and being the winner in it. Now, Paul takes that whole picture here and he condenses it into these verses and applies it to our Christian life, to our heavenly citizenship. Now, Scripture tells us that there is coming a time when every follower of Jesus Christ, every follower of Jesus Christ is going to stand before him and we're going to account for the heavenly citizenship that we have lived out here on earth. It's going to be evaluated, it's going to be judged, and rewards are going to be handed out. It's what the scriptures call the judgment seat of Christ. And I know when we hear that word judgment, we instantly think about it in a negative sense, but this is not a, a, a judgment for whether or not we are saved, whether or not we enter the kingdom of heaven. The issue of whether we enter the kingdom of heaven or not has to be settled right here in this life. Salvation has to be taken care of right here in this life. And that comes by putting our faith in the finished work of Jesus on the cross for us. When we put our faith in him, we receive the gift of salvation and we receive heavenly citizenship. The time that we're talking about today is going to be after our life is over and we stand before our Lord and he's going to look and he's going to evaluate how we've lived out our heavenly citizenship on earth. Did we live for his kingdom or did we end up living more for our kingdom? Did we live for and by his values and his standards and his ways? Our, was our life marked by other values and standards and ways? And from that review will come what Paul calls here the prize, our rewards from Jesus himself. You know, as we, we think about this today, this, this is a great reminder of the importance of our life here on earth. Uh, keeping with Paul's metaphor here, the race that we're running on earth right now, 
is going to determine the rewards that we receive in heaven. And to run your race well, what Paul is going to remind us of here is that you have to keep in mind the right focus. You have to keep in mind the vision of where we're headed. See, we will live our heavenly citizenship better here below if we focus on the heavenly finish line above. And Paul here, as I mentioned, is describing our heavenly citizenship in terms of a race. And so keeping with that picture that he uses today, we're going to focus on what Paul says here about our race. And Paul is going to tell us how we can run our race well so that at the end it really ends well and we can walk up on that day before our Lord and be looking forward to receiving the prize that he wants to give to us. In fact, in these verses, Paul reminds us that there's two things that are important for running well. Uh, they're not really complicated to understand, but they're not always easy to do. So let's look at those together. The first of those is this. Paul's going to tell us here in these verses that to run well, don't give up. If you're going to run this race well, don't give up. And please note how Paul opens up this whole matter of running our race well. Look again at the very beginning of verse 12. He says, not that I have already obtained all this, or I have already arrived at my goal. Now, when Paul writes this letter, he is about 30 years into his spiritual journey. It's been about 30 years since he has come to faith in Christ. And if, if you know the story of Paul, you know that in those 30 years, some pretty incredible things have happened in Paul's life. I mean, this is a man that was massively changed from being a persecutor of Christ in the church to being a champion of Christ and his church. I mean, this is the man that in those 30 years wrote what we know today is about half of our New Testament. This is a man who had a number of supernatural encounters with the Lord Jesus. He was used to work some incredible miracles, and he preached the gospel to what would have been then a good portion of the uh, Gentile world. And in doing that, uh, probably safe to say that hundreds upon hundreds of people through Paul's ministry came to faith in Jesus, as well as the many churches that he planted that literally changed the face of the Gentile world. Now think about that and then look at what Paul says here because Paul says, look, regardless of all of that, Paul says, I still don't have it all together in the spiritual race of mine. You know, Paul says, I don't always keep a perfect spiritual stride. There's still days that I get tripped up. There's days that I get slowed down. Now, for Paul to be talking about running our race well, but starting that way, I don't know about you, but I find that so incredibly encouraging. Because let's think about how easy, how easy is it to, to let our moments of spiritual failure get us down and hold us back? And what about those days when you just fall down over and over and over? And we've all had those days, spiritually speaking, just can't seem to get it together. You can become pretty discouraged. I mean, you can become pretty defeated. And when you read some of the, the calls here that we are to rise up to as the people of God, you can wonder, man, am I ever going to get to that? And you can just wonder, is, is it really worth it? pushing forward on. But remember here, Paul reminds us, Paul gives us a reality check about the spiritual life. He reminds us that there are stops and starts in the spiritual life. There are days 
when you are going to hit your spiritual stride, I mean, you are going to feel like spiritually you're on top of it and everything will just click. But Paul says there's just going to be days and moments when you find yourself spiritually limping. Now, some of you that know me, you will know that I, I run and I, I enjoy running. And uh, I also enjoy from time to time, I like to read about running. And I like to watch some of the races that, that show up on TV from time to time. Now, I have to admit, and I was thinking about this, looking at this picture of the way Paul describes the Christian life as running, that uh, I've seen a number of races. I've read a number of books uh, I've even run some good moments myself, but I doubt there is probably any runner that would say, I've run just the absolute perfect race. I've really never heard a runner do that. Now, I've, had, I've heard runners talk about, man, I really ran great, but there's always something in their race that they realized it could be tweaked, it could be adjusted, it, it could be a little better. Paul says, look, that, that's, that's the way it is with our spiritual lives. Okay? Some days we run good, and even those moments we could probably tweak something to make it better. But some days, Paul says, I'm running my race, and it, it isn't so good. Paul says, look, I, 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 even I'm not finished. I don't always have it together. But notice what Paul says in the second part of verse 12. He says, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Look at verse 14. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Do you catch that word Paul uses? Paul says, look, I don't always have it together. I have times I have to get up off the ground and start running again. But Paul says, I'm pressing on. Paul says that twice here in verse 12 and verse 14. That word press that Paul uses here, that is a word that when you hear it, here's what you need to think about. Think about a runner dripping sweat. A runner pushing themselves down the course when they're tired, when they're aching. Think about a runner getting up and getting back on the course after a stumble. It's a picture of continued effort and continued exertion and expending of energy in one direction, and that is forward toward the finish line. Paul says that's how to run your race. Don't quit. Yes, you're going to stumble. You're going to fall. Get up, but keep moving forward toward the the finish line. And Paul reminds us with that word press that in this race there is a price to be paid for us to finish well. Yes, yes, we, we will have our moments of stumbling out there on the course, but the answer is not to quit. Paul says the answer here is to press on. It will mean sacrifice sometimes. It will mean to be inconvenienced sometimes. It will mean to have your priorities adjusted sometimes, just like athletes often have to do. They have to make adjustments and changes to keep going, but you press on, Paul says, toward the finish line and finishing well. Listen today, our spiritual race is not about perfection alone. It's about direction. It's about growing in obedience and pressing on always forward toward the heavenly finish line. Paul says, look, to run this race well, don't quit. Even in your bad days, don't quit. Get up, dust yourself off, repent, and keep pressing forward. Now, Paul has a second thing to remind us of here to help us run well, and that is Paul's going to tell us that to run well, we need 
to not get distracted. Paul says to run well, don't get distracted. Look at verse 13. He says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, I forget what is behind and I strain toward what is ahead. Since the uh, start of this COVID pandemic, I've uh, read a couple of articles um, that point out that Americans, due to the fact that a lot of gyms have been closed down, and of course, being at home with everybody, our uh, time has kind of become, uh, it's become infringed upon in ways that we are not necessarily used to in our every day. We kind of have things planned out. Uh, it's, it's given Americans a lot less time to exercise. And I read a couple articles that said that, that for a number of Americans, that has led to a weight gain of anywhere between about four and 16 pounds. So on average, here in America, uh, through this pandemic, Americans in general have gained somewhere in the neighborhood of four to 16 pounds. In other words, uh, there are Americans hauling more weight around than they were at one time. Now, Paul says, look, be careful in your spiritual race that you don't get distracted, that you don't get weighed down, that you don't take on weight that you shouldn't, and then you end up not being able to run as well as you could. You see, to get to your tomorrow, to get to the finish line, Paul says you have got to let some things go. You've, you've got to let yesterday go. And you've got to move forward toward where the finish line is. And the finish line, Paul says, isn't back there in your yesterday. Now, here's the thing. All of us, all of us have yesterdays. Even Paul. Paul had yesterdays. And like our yesterdays, Paul's was filled with some wonderful things. And it was filled with some not so wonderful things. In fact, some pretty bad things. In fact, in the earlier part of chapter 3, uh, the first 11 verses, Paul actually mentions some of the good and some of the bad. We're, we're not going to read those passages today. You can go and read those for yourself a little later. In fact, as you make your way through the New Testament as a whole, uh, you will find quite a bit about Paul's life. Paul reveals quite a bit about himself, the good and the bad. Uh, Paul had an incredible background growing up. Uh, Paul talks about the fact that he was born a Jew, through which the law was given, through which Christ came. Uh, he uh, grew up and, and studied under one of the best teachers of his day, a guy named Gamaliel. Paul grew up to be a Pharisee. I mean, in Paul's day, if you wanted to be at the top of the religious ladder, what you wanted to be was a Pharisee. And not only was he just a Pharisee, but Paul talks about that his zeal outstripped most of the people of his day for God. I mean, he was deeply passionate about God, although misguided. And Paul said, when it came to the law, I was absolutely blameless. Paul said, when it came to the law, I tried to live by it as absolutely straight as I could. Paul said, I, I held up and lived to it uh, even above other people that were doing the same thing. Paul had an incredible conversion experience. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, after that conversion experience, Paul had some incredible, incredible encounters with Christ. And Christ used him in some incredibly powerful, powerful ways. Now, Paul acknowledges those things. But here's the thing, Paul never, ever lives in them. There is no sense when you read the Apostle Paul uh, that he feels like he's somehow spiritually arrived or that he has spiritually experienced all that he ever could. He's reached the pinnacle. You never sense that in Paul. For Paul, it's never I've reached. It's always I'm pressing forward. Paul does not allow the great events in his life to become the highlight of his life. 
Now, I know when we think about this verse, we think about bad things, but here's the thing. Even good things can sometimes hold us back. Some of us have some great things in our background. We have, we have like Paul, a great spiritual background. And in some cases, we've had some great, incredible encounters with God, and we've seen God do some incredible things, and we've seen God change us and grow us in some wonderful ways. And listen, it is great that that happens, and it is fine to acknowledge that, but it is never okay to settle in that. What God did for us in the past is to be remembered and it is to be thankful for, but it is never ever to be lived in and said, that's good enough. Because God's always got more for us to experience from him. And then, of course, there is what we think about when we think about this verse, I think, and that is the bad. And listen, Paul had bad. Paul, by his own admission in the scriptures, was a murderer, a blasphemer, and a persecutor of Christ and the church. In fact, in one of his letters, Paul says this of himself. Paul says, I am the chief of all sinners. Now, you may think, I have some really dark things in my life. And Paul would say, you might. But when I'm compared to you, Paul says, look, I'm still the chief of all sinners. Paul had that past. But here's the thing. That past did not have Paul. Paul did not allow his past, as dark as it was, as sinful as it was, Paul did not allow that to affect his present and his future for Christ. And he didn't because God had a solution that he embraced. It's called grace. It's the unmerited favor of God through his son, Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that where sin abounds... The grace of God abounds anymore. In other words, whatever your sin is, no matter how dark, how big, how deep, he says, listen, God's got enough grace for that. God in Christ Jesus through his death at the cross and his resurrection from the dead has done everything that is necessary and everything that makes his work sufficient to forgive the darkest sin. But unfortunately, here's the thing today. Some of you that are listening to me today, you are still anchored to your past. And when you try to run your race, when you try to step up for God, it rears its head and you begin to stumble along. Some of you today you're trying to run your race wearing a full set of clothes covered by a trench coat with heavy boots and carrying a backpack filled with the weights of the sins of your past and your wrongs. Listen to me this morning. Christ took the weight of our sins and our failures and our evils at the cross. Our sin, all of our sin, the darkest, deepest, evilest sin was laid upon him so that his perfect righteousness could be laid upon every single one of us who accept what he did. It's our sins that brought his nailing to the cross so that we could be given forgiveness and we could walk away free people. You know, the Bible reminds us that as far as the east is from the west, so far has Christ cast away our sins. It's time today for you to lay aside what God has already put away. When God takes care of your sin, 
It's taken care of. He's not going to pull it out again. So why are you? Some of us need to desperately lay aside what God has already put away in our lives. Notice what Paul said here. He said, I forget. That doesn't mean Paul didn't think about it. What Paul means here is I'm not influenced by that anymore. That thing, that sin, that failure does not have a hold on me anymore. What is behind me is behind me. It's about what's ahead of me now, Paul says, that matters. What Christ has for me is out there, not back here. We cannot cross the finish line well, living always in our pasts. The God of our pasts, the God that can cover your pasts, He's also the God of your present and your future. When he covers your past, he's done with it. We need to be done with it. We need to be like Paul said, forgetting what's behind and now straining toward what is ahead. Let me have you think about a few things this morning. I want you to think about how are you running your race today? Are you sidelined? Maybe you've just about given up. Listen, someone has already run this race first, and they've ran it perfectly. It's the person called Jesus, and he has what you and I need. He has strength, he has forgiveness, he has grace, he has encouragement, he has rest, so we can run our race well, and he is more than willing to offer it if we ask for it. Now, some of you are running today, but let me ask you this. Is anything weighing you down? You dragging some things around? It might be something good. You're living in a past victory. That's great. That's past victory. Christ has some present and future victories for you to experience. But more likely than not, what some of us are carrying around is the weight of a past that we think we've wasted, sins so dark and deep, maybe we've never even shared some of them. Well, my friend, can I just tell you this morning, Jesus knows all about you. And he still loves you. And Christ endured the weight of the cross. Not only did he carry his own cross to the place of execution, but then when nailed up on it, he actually bore the weight of all of our sins, no matter how dark or how deep. So that when we received him, we could walk away totally forgiven. It is for freedom, the Bible says, that Christ has set you free. Listen, the enemy's heart is bondage. The heart of Jesus for you, it's freedom. Some of you will be familiar with the name uh, David Livingston. Uh, Dr. Livingston was a missionary a long time ago uh, to the continent of Africa. And in fact, uh, he really penetrated into areas of it that no one had gone and he spent years there working and <clears throat> sharing the gospel. And eventually, when he was finished there, he returned to Great Britain. And one day, after having been back for a while, someone happened to see them. And they said, so where do you want to go now, Dr. Livingston? And I love his reply. He said, I'm ready to go anywhere, provided it's forward. What a great answer. I'm, I'm ready to go anywhere. Provided it's forward. Listen, if we are going to live out well our heavenly citizenship on this earth, we will only do so if we keep going forward with God. Keeping in view that heavenly finish line. That's what we're running for. For that day when we stand before the one who loves us, the one who died for us, the one who is waiting to reward us. 
So let's keep moving forward. Let's run. And let's run to win. Would you pray with me today? Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I think today that some of us, we're running. But we are so weighed down today. Lord, some of us here, we've confessed our sins and our wrongs. And still the devil keeps trying to pile on the weight of our past sins and our past life and lie to us. And Lord, it, it's hampering our run today. It's hampering the living out of our new heavenly citizenship today. Well, I pray right now in the name of our Lord Jesus that freedom would flood into the lives of anyone that is bound and weighted down. It is for freedom, Lord Jesus, that you came to set us free. May we run as free people, forgiven, headed toward that heavenly finish line, looking for the day when we cross it and you reward us for the race that we've run here. Father, strengthen us. When we fall down, help us not to give up. You don't give up on us. Help us to dust ourselves off, repent of our failures, and run this race to win. Father, I pray and I ask that in the name of Jesus right now. And look, I want to encourage you, maybe right now, you just need to continue talking to the Lord, even as we're getting ready to go into song together. I just want to encourage you to do that. Pour your heart out to him today. Ask him to set, to help you to know that freedom that you've received. The truth is we're free. Sometimes we just need the realization of it. So I'd encourage you right now, if you still need to call out to God, you need to pray, keep doing that. And we're going to move into song and, and we'll be back in just a moment to close out our service today.
again for uh, being with me with our worship team here from Oak Bend Church today and boy I hope today that, that God has just spoke to your heart you know I think one of the things we desperately need to experience as the people of God on a regular basis is the freedom that is ours freedom from the the, the, the guilt and, and and the past that we sometimes carry around but also recognizing that we're free from that hold of sin that we can live pleasing to God in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that God has a life for us to experience with Him now and in the future. And I just want to encourage you to keep pressing on for what God has. Again, let me say, as I, I often try to do as, as we finish these services to our uh, body here at Oak Bend Church, if there is any way um, that we can help you, that I, Pastor Dustin, our elders can help you during this time. Like I said, I know we're not together inside a church, but we are here at the office um, most of the week, and uh, we want to be available to you. So please let us know any way that we can be praying for you or ministering to you. We certainly want to do that to the best of our ability uh, and for the glory of God. Again, I want to thank you so much uh, for joining with me today around the Word of God and uh, with our worship team as we've been singing. I pray that you have a great Sunday. I pray that as you head into this week, you will be able to run your race with joy and with freedom as the Lord intended. And by His will and grace, we'll meet together here again next week. Take care and have a great day.